Hi, good evening, and thank you for joining us for this session of the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement. And tonight we are discussing with an amateur, what I would call an amateur expert on Bitcoin. My guest tonight, and please ask her lots of questions and she will attempt to answer them. This woman is named Amy Stevenson. She's really a microbiologist, but, and she has a PhD from where? UVM. From UVM in microbiology. However, she has become a real connoisseur, put it that way, of Bitcoin, uh, and more importantly, how Bitcoin affects or could have political, social, and economic consequences for the whole world. She is more or less an amateur, but she's the person I know that has studied the situation of Bitcoin and knows more about it than anybody I know. And most of us, uh, including me, are really puzzled by it and very interested in it at the same time. So the format this evening will be, uh, I'll introduce Amy and she'll say a couple words, but then I hope to open this up for community discussion and I will try to ask her questions also that occur to me, but please feel free. And you, you would be free with interruptions also, right? If you want to. Yeah, sure. Okay. So if anybody also wants to interrupt her and ask her questions as we go along, that's also perfectly fine. Most of us probably don't know much about Bitcoin. So ask all the questions you want and Amy will attempt to answer them. I'm not going to be able to answer them but I certainly will be able to ask questions. Okay, so here's Amy. Are you gonna say? <laughs> well, I guess I just say how, the, how you got interested. Yeah, right? that's what I was gonna say. I um, started looking into Bitcoin because I guess it may be a year and a half ago, my two teenage boys told me that they bought Bitcoin. And I'm like, how'd you buy Bitcoin? And they're like, oh, through this app called Coinbase. And Coinbase is one of the more popular um, exchanges out there for buying Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And that's how I just, I got interested and I wanted to invest in it myself, but I really wanted to understand more about it and how it worked before I investigated or before I invested in it. Um, and so I took a couple courses um, I had heard about Bitcoin on some podcasts, some other podcasts I'd been listening to, and I took a cryptocurrency course, one on um, an online, um, you know, non-accredited uh, situation called Renegade um, University, and, yeah. Yeah, I like that. and then I took another course from this guy, John Bush, who lives in Texas and has been big time into cryptocurrency. And I actually feel like I need to go back and like review those courses again, because I probably understand so much more. But um, as they say in the Bitcoin world, I went down, you know, the proverbial rabbit hole. About Bitcoin. About Bitcoin. And um, I guess one of the other things that uh, I realized is that Bitcoin is very different from other cryptocurrencies. Okay, let's stop there, if you don't mind. Yes. Because now Emmy's going to try to uh, at least clear up for me. I don't even know what cryptocurrency really means. If any of the others do, um, that would be great. But I'm going to ask Amy to distinguish Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and currency. Do any of us really know what currency is in the first place? We do because we have some of that and we use it. But we really don't know, I don't think, what money really is all about. So let's start, I guess, with what you said, cryptocurrency, what is it? So um, ever since like the seventies, you know, beginning of computer science, there have been these ideas of creating a digital cash. Digital but cash. But there are, there were always problems with that. Um, and without getting into too much detail, there were several problems that needed to be solved. Like, you know, there's a double spending problem so that, you know, you can guarantee that I didn't send it to you and send it to someone else and spend the same thing on Google to do to two different people. Um, and so, you know, it, it's been since then that, you know, from cryptography is a big part of it because, um, you know, if you're talking about a digital cash, a digital form of currency, 
you know, it has to be very secure. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, you know, the, the cryptography portion of it. All um, uh, Bitcoin and um, other cryptocurrencies work on what's called a blockchain, which is just really a digital ledger system of transactions. Okay, but what's the difference then between that and um, real currency? Well, if you want to call that real currency, real currency like the USD, US dollar. Yeah, well, um, the US dollar is what uh, you know a lot of Bitcoiners and cryptocurrency folks will refer to as a fiat currency. Fiat currency. Because since you know 1971, it has not been backed by gold. Okay, let's stop there again. Does everybody know what? Amy means when she said it's not backed by gold. The US dollar used to be backed by gold, right? Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. And why that's important? It's important because, yeah. um, you know, over the evolution of humans and, you know, ever since we started trading with one another, um, you know, the, when you, we were first trading, you know, it might be barter. Like I have some apples and, and you have some oranges. It's a bad yeah. example. And I have to want your apples and you have to want my oranges. So we have to both, you know, want the same thing that the other person has. So that's how, you know, currency evolved where they were collectibles, things of value that were agreed upon that had value. Right. And, you know, over um, you know, several hundreds, if not even thousands of years, I would say, you know, people settled on gold being um, one of these precious things that everybody felt had value for a number of different reasons. And I brought actually a book with me because I always forget um, there are several different um, characteristics of what makes a, you know, a good currency, a good store of value. Um, it's gotta be durable, portable, fungible. Fungible meaning that you know uh, one ounce of gold is just like another, another ounce, ounce of gold. gold right. It's got to be verifiable, you know, like you got to be able to determine that's real gold, not fake gold. Um, it's got to be divisible, you know, gold you can cut into coins and, and small um, portions. It's got to be scarce. That's right. really important. That's part of what differentiates both gold and Bitcoin from fiat currency is fiat currency, as we know, is not scarce. They just print more of it when they okay. need it. Can we stop? Okay. So everybody understands what Amy is saying, that the U.S. dollar used to be based on gold. In other words, you could take your U.S. dollars and take $35 and buy an ounce of gold. So that gold was uh, the backing of the U.S. dollar. That disappeared. The gold standard, the United States went off the gold standard. Anybody know when? In other words, the United States said, we're gonna forget about this gold stuff. We went off the gold standard in 1973 when President Richard Nixon decided that we couldn't finance the Vietnam War unless we had lots and lots of dollars. We didn't have that much gold, however. So he just said, we're gonna just print all this money. We're gonna forget about the gold and we're going to print money as much as necessary in order to finance the war in Vietnam. So we no longer have gold backing the dollar, which means that when we were on the dollar, the amount of dollars that the government put out had to be backed up by an amount of gold that was stored at Fort Knox. <clears throat> Richard Nixon said, forget it, we can't do war that way. So we're gonna eliminate the gold standard. After that, the government just took charge of printing money and that is fiat money. That has no backing whatsoever, as far as I can tell. Is that right, true? Right. I mean, and that's why we needed the gold standard, right? Right. Okay, gone. So now we're talking about fiat currency. And what Bitcoin is seems an alternative to that. It right? is, though some people would argue that Bitcoin's also fiat because what's backing, you know, Bitcoin, right? Nothing. But similar to gold, and while that took, you know, millennia, um, you know, in this digital age, things do move a lot faster. Uh, Bitcoin's been around since, um, I think, 2011. Uh, I think it was 2011. Was it 2009? I'm sorry. If I don't have the exact details. But it's been around um, for 10, 11 years now. And there is, you know, a growing consensus that Bitcoin has 
a similar value all into its own, which is really, you know, what we humans attribute is to it. Is it purchasing power? Well, it's, if we go back to all of these, um, these characteristics, the, the last two were established history and censorship resistance. You know, Bitcoin probably fares the least well on the established history because it has only been around for 10 years or so. Um, but it is, you know, very durable. It's very, it's very portable, much more so than gold. Um, cause gold, you know, you, it's heavy. it's heavy and you know, it's hard to transport it. And there's, um, there's risks in transporting it that someone will take it from you, you know? So it's got issues that way. Um, you know, Bitcoin's fungible, it's verifiable. It's very divisible. In mm -hmm. fact, there's a unit of, you know, one Bitcoin, I think, um, right now is worth somewhere like $38,000, $40,000. And one, so, Bitcoin? one Bitcoin, but it's divisible <laughs> to nine decimal points. So oh actually there's a smaller um, unit of the Bitcoin, like there is a cent to a dollar, there is a Satoshi, and it's named after Satoshi Nakamoto, who is the, you know, the inventor of Bitcoin. Um, so it has all of these properties and it's scarce because there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoins mined by virtue of how it was programmed, how the software was programmed. And every four years, the number of Bitcoins that um, the miners are rewarded with uh, is halved. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, close to 19 million of those Bitcoin are already, in, you know, mined and in circulation. And the last Bitcoin is um, going to be, it's projected to be mined sometime in the year 2140. What is it though? Exactly. It's, okay. It's, it's so, not a commodity that you can put your hands on, correct? Right. I know. Okay, and I so think so that's what, what bugs it? people yeah. the most about it is because yeah. it's got this um, abstract no aspect to it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so the way that, that um, how do you acquire it? Okay, so you can acquire it in a lot of different ways. I mean, the most common way is to go to one of these exchanges. What um, is an exchange? An exchange is uh, a place where you can change your fiat dollars into Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency. Is it a physical or is it? Digital? No, it's a digital okay. thing. So it's, you know, it's like an app you download on your phone or it's a, you know, a, a website you go to in your computer. Mm -hmm. And you set up an account and with the exchanges and the, the current regulations in the United States, they're what is known as KYC, know your customers. So if you go and purchase it through the exchanges. What is it called? The exchange? Yeah. Well, the most popular one is called Coinbase. Okay. So what do you do? Google it or something? Yeah. You, okay. I think it's just Coinbase.com. And it's an app you can download on your smartphone too, if you have a smartphone. And... Um, then, you know, whatever the going rate is, you pay that amount plus some Where fee. You, and and you, it depends, the fee depends on the exchange, how much that's going to be. Uh -huh, okay. And that's how you purchase Bitcoin. And the way that you, like, own your Bitcoin, there's a saying in the Bitcoin world, um, you don't own your Bitcoin if you don't have your keys or something along that line. No keys, no ownership. So the keys, these private keys, are the mechanism by which um, you, you access and trade your Bitcoin. And you, know, you can use your Bitcoin to buy things, but the biggest um, you know, advantage I see in Bitcoin right now is to use it as a hedge against the fiat USD uh, because our dollars are you know, becoming more and more worthless. Okay, that's a complicated idea. More okay, yeah. Because okay. of inflation, right? Right, right? So if you buy a certain amount of Bitcoin with your fiat dollars right now, you know, that hundred dollars that I might pay for a certain portion of a Bitcoin, you know, in, in five years, that same hundred dollars in USD might be worth fifty dollars, yeah, right? right, right nothing. <laughs> Maybe mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin over the course of you know the past 10 years has has, you know, it's very volatile, which anything you invest in, you actually want it to be volatile because you want it to go up, right? Mm -hmm. You want to invest in something that's a flat line. But you don't want it to drop. But it, and it will go up and down. But if you are investing in it for the longer term, you know, for five, 10 year horizon or even longer, it, you know, is, I mean, I'm not, I can't 
say what's going to happen in the future, but by what has happened in the past, it seems like it will continue. It's been running continuously for 10 years with no hacking, no issues whatsoever. Except yeah. it goes down. Well, yeah, it can go down in price, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. And that has to do with how many Bitcoins are being bought and sold and, and traded out there in, in the, the digital world. Are there yeah. a lot? But mm -hmm. for Jane no okay. okay. Hey, Hi, Jane. Hi, everybody. Um, really interesting conversation. I'm learning learning some new things about the mechanics of Bitcoin. Um, but I think that this point that you just made, that was just made about the volatility of the price and how it is trending up, that goes up and down, up and down, you know, in my mind means it's not really a money. It, it's like an alternative to invest, buying a stock. Um, and so the money is still what, you know, the, the Federal Reserve of the United States supplies. It's not a competitor to Federal Reserve notes, into my way of thinking. Um, Wait a minute, can I say something for a minute? A competitor, a competitor to money? I don't see it as a competitor to the oh. Federal Reserve notes, because if, you know, I, I'm very much a Keynesian economist, and Keynes defines money as, as the riskless asset. And you need a... A capitalist system needs a riskless asset to kind of as the anchor of everything else. And Bitcoin is not that. Um, Bitcoin is something else. So, so what I, was your question? I, I'm just making the, it's not a question. It's oh, a, okay. Sorry. It's a point. Well, go ahead. I mean, to that, I would answer that, you know, the United States and the Federal Reserve is looking at doing, a, you know, a digital currency themselves. Yeah. That would be very different from Bitcoin. Yeah, that it would it's be not, centrally controlled. It's not, it's, not, it's, it's not blockchain. It's just no, it's Ethereum. It's proof of stake. And the problem with that is that it's it, the consensus can be cheated. And so that means that it can be centrally controlled. One of the best things about Bitcoin and the Bitcoin blockchain is it's completely decentralized. It cannot be shut down. Um, and it cannot be controlled by one party. And, you know, I would say that right now, a lot of governments, not just ours, are looking to get rid of cash. And, you know, with getting rid of cash, we get rid of privacy. Um, we, you know, we get rid of, um, you know, our control over our own money because, you know, moving to a central bank digital currency, if, your government isn't happy with you know what you're doing or what you're buying or things that they're tracking through your spending of their central you know their cryptocurrency they can just shut it off and i don't think that's a good position to be in um and i think that's why people see bitcoin as being really valuable because i think at some point if we do have enough central bank digital currencies there are going to be certain things that you can only buy with Bitcoin. Though I would That's also right. say to Jane's point, it, you know, whether it's a currency or not, I think it is a currency and that in some places in the world, uh, and even in the United States, you can buy things with it. Yeah. But wow. it's more of a store of value, I'd say, than anything else. Okay. And the way that, you know, the big way that, like, say, El, El Salvador adopted it as right. um, its currency. Right. And so the thing that's making that possible is uh, this yeah. thing called the Lightning Network, which runs on top of the Bitcoin blockchain and it allows for off-chain transactions because when, when a block of transactions is added to the blockchain, it happens about every 10 minutes and um, it's through additional blocks being added that really secure those transactions that happened before, because it's very it's almost impossible to go back and then change that. Mm -hmm. um, so that takes too much time. So they have this lightning network um, that works through an app that you put money in it and you can do all these exchanges, like to buy a cup of coffee um, or you know spend your Bitcoin on whatever, groceries, anything that you normally spend on. And then it only settles when you close out that node on the Lightning Network. Okay. Um, and you can continue to add you know, money to your, your 
you know, your Lightning wallet as needed from fiat to Bitcoin. So the very cool thing about that, it, I mean, one of the cool things, because I want to get to your point about like, how is this helping people like in countries where they don't have access to stable currencies or even where they're being sanctioned by the US? <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so with El Salvador, you know, I, it's a very high percentage of like 70 or 80% of their um, gross national practice remittances from the United States. Okay, so, okay, so, all right, so, so what's a remittance? A remittance is like someone in the United States sending money cash. to a family member cash. in El Salvador. Right, but that's in right. cash, U.S. dollars. They usually do it, yes, okay. through like Western Union, right? right? And and that's not even an option in Cuba anymore. No. Um, so... In that scenario, if I have my mom living in El Salvador and I want to send her a hundred dollars, you know, I get I go to a Western Union, they take their cut right. out of it, which can be substantial, you right. know, it, uh, it can be between 10 and 15 percent at least. Um, and I've heard even up to 30 percent, and then my mom has to go travel to wherever the closest Western Union is to her. And she's got to then take that cash out in, you know, whatever the El Salvador currency, currency was. Right. Um, and she risks, you know, coming out of the Western Union. They know people coming out of the Western Union are carrying cash. So if you were someone wanting to take advantage of people, that's where you'd be waiting, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a risk. So now with Bitcoin, I download the Strike app on my phone, which is okay, how so you access you the download. Lightning Network. Okay. I add my money in U.S. dollars. Money in U.S. dollars. Right? And it travels across the, the, the Bitcoin network and to the app on her smartphone. Because a lot of people, you know, whereas accessing a Western Union can be difficult, a lot of people have smartphones yes, right. and internet access. I mean, right. that's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, so then she gets the Bitcoin on in, her, her, in her app, in her wallet right. on the Lightning Network. That's what it's called, her wallet. Yep. It's not an actual physical wallet. It's uh, no, on, it's okay. an app on right. phone. Okay. But they call them wallets. And then she can um, take that out of the app and deposit it, you know. Take what out of the app? The, she can convert it to, you know. El Salvador money. Yeah. Except El Salvador is all Bitcoin. But no, they have to go back and forth, okay. I think, between the two. Okay. Um, is my understanding. So it's, in other words, you're sending between cash US to dollars. somebody. I think it's US dollars. You're sending purchasing power to someone yeah, and then, through yeah. the internet. So it makes it safer, right? Because if the mom didn't have to go to the Western Union. It makes it easier because they didn't have to go to the Western Union. And it, it puts, you know, between 15 and 30% more money in their pocket to spend, you know, on things they need. Okay. So, and, you know, that to me is a huge advantage. And like in Venezuela, I read a you know a story recently about Venezuela, um, which has been subject to embargoes and blockades by the United States government, right? And often, if people try to leave, if they're carrying any kind of currency or valuables, it's stolen from them. Mm -hmm. So this is a way, you know, you can cross a border with your Bitcoin, even if you don't have a smartphone, because there are, you know, for your wallet, there's always a recovery phrase, a mnemonic of twelve or twenty-four words. And if you memorize those 12 or 24 words, you get to where you're going. You get buy yourself a smartphone, download the app, and you, you know, so put in your way. recovery phrase and there's your money. You okay, know, it didn't get stolen. All right. So how would you, if you wanted to use Bitcoin to purchase something, how do you do that? Oh, okay. So I was kind of getting there and then we got all um, sidetracked. So the, um, the app, it's similar to... The app accesses the camera on your smartphone and it scans a QR code from the merchant. Everybody know what a QR code I is? I don't know that people will. It's yeah. this. <laughs> so I don't know that I have one that I could show someone right now. Um, you know, it's one of those little squares that has a pattern in it. On and your computer. Yeah, and you'll, you, your camera, most smartphones recognize them and that's how the the QR code represents the address for the wallet that uh -huh. you're either transferring the money to or from. Okay. All right. But you're gonna you are gonna mention how you purchase stuff. Right. Bitcoin. So the merchant displays the address for their wallet as a QR code, like right on the counter underneath where you're buying the coffee. 
and um, they tell you how much it is and you put in like $2 and you just hit send, you scan the QR code and it goes to that person's wallet. It's as easy as using a credit card, maybe even easier. Okay, so, but then what is, what is that to the person who receives it? Dollars or Bitcoin or well, what? That's the, the thing that I haven't gotten into the details in a while. There's actually a really good um, podcast called What Bitcoin Did. And the host of that podcast, um, Peter McCormick, interviews the president of El Salvador, as well as um, the guy who uh, is behind the strike app, um, whose name I'm not remembering either. But anyhow, they explain exactly how it works. And there is a reserve of Bitcoin that the country owns that, that um, you know, because in that two two seconds that it took me to send that Bitcoin, the price might drop or go up just slightly, right? Mm -hmm. It's not gonna, of course, fluctuate hugely in two seconds, mm -hmm. but that reserve of Bitcoin is, evens that out for then converting it to dollars. Okay, so. So that my $2 that I sent to him is the $2 company. he receives, yeah. So regardless but he, but of whether he received it do dollars, USD. Yeah, because they can put it back into dollars. Yeah. Okay. It, can, right. it actually allows you to transfer between, I mean, that's a big issue is transferring between currencies across the world. And this is a solution for being able to, to transfer U.S. Okay. dollars to another currency. Right, do you have a question? Yeah, so once you invest in this, is can your money you, can people hear can you get it back? Your fiat? Your money, your whatever you no, uh, you can get it back. You can. Mm -hmm. How? No. You just have to sell your Bitcoin to someone oh. for fiat. Oh, okay. Yeah, which you know can happen over an exchange. You can also do peer to peer. Um, there's also Bitcoin ATMs where you can exchange. Where are these ATMs? Well, usually big cities. We don't have one in Burlington. Mm -hmm. I checked. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, where you you know and. and with all of these exchanges, there's usually some sort of fee. So it's always good to look into what the fees are. I mean, I'm not crazy about Coinbase. Um, if I, what, in the Bitcoin world, they call it stacking sats. If you kind of, you know, you do um, a purchase like every week to kind of cost average. Uh, so for that, I would, or even large purchases, I'd recommend this um, outfit called Swan Bitcoin, like okay. Swan the bird. Yeah. Good. Okay, so this is, you put money into Bitcoin. In other words, you purchase it with USD. Yes. And it's like an investment into Bitcoin. Yes. And then through your computer, you can transfer those Bitcoins other places to other people's wallets. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then they can transfer that Bitcoin in their wallet to a, a national currency. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And the same thing happens when you purchase something. In a way, I mean, you can. In a way, yeah. Okay. All right, but all of this is on your phone or on the internet. Okay. Yeah. Are there other questions or thoughts? Yeah, I've got one. How does the um, the constant right. variability? How does the constant variability of the price of Bitcoin affect its actual value as a currency? What? How does the variability affect it? Well, the I think that's, that is yeah. one of the things that makes it, you know, that's what I was just talking about in terms of El Salvador having, you know, a Bitcoin treasury so they can make up for those little differences in the transactions because it is volatile. So it is one of the drawbacks of using it as a currency. I mean, I think eventually it will stabilize, but there are, you know, a lot of institutional investors that, haven't got into Bitcoin that are starting to get into Bitcoin now. And so I think it really has, you know, a lot of upward growth and potential. But Barry, does your question kind of assume that the US dollar is not variable? Uh, maybe one or 2% a year, but Bitcoin lost half of its value recently, didn't it? Uh, yeah. I went for about 60 to 40, yeah. But I would, I, I mean, doesn't also, maybe Jane would have an answer to this. Doesn't also the USD kind of lose value when there's inflation? Yeah. Is, am I yep. wrong about that, Jane? Yep. You are not wrong. Yep. It loses purchasing power. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. I mean. 
Yeah, I guess that it's not losing that power. It's not considered variable, right? Well, but can I just say, yeah. can I just say, um, it's also not true that the quantity of fiat money is just unlimited, right? It it is. It, there, that's what central banks do, is they control the rate of growth of the stock of bank reserves, which is tied loosely to the rate of growth of money. Um, and I think that the fall in Bitcoin this week was linked to very clear signs that the Fed's going to get serious about inflation. So what do you mean? They're going to what do you mean? They're going to try to set prices, fix pri what? No, no, one, no one can fix prices in this economy. Right. And so that when. When Biden talks about they're going to take on inflation, it's like, what the hell do you think a president can do about inflation? Um, no, they're going to bring about an increase in interest rates, and they're going to stop buying government debt and, and agency mortgage-backed securities. And that's going to put upward pressure on both short-term and long-term interest rates, which will slow down the economy. Right now, we've got um, supply chain problems, Right. Combined with very strong levels of aggregate demand. And the only way to slow down that economy, I think, is to slow down the growth of aggregate demand. The supply chain problems are not going to resolve until we really get out of the pandemic. But anyway, so I think there's a link between Federal Reserve policy and Bitcoin prices. When, and I, I think that it's thinking of Bitcoin as an inflation hedge is, I think, a really good way to think about it. As a what? Uh, and a, as a is as an inflation, a hedge against inflation. It's, it's like gold. I mean, gold is a hedge against inflation. So yeah. in, in a way, Bitcoin is a is a competitor with gold, or it's like a gold, yeah. a 21st century yeah. version of gold. If you will. Right, right. Yeah. Can you explain that though more, that it's, it's a hedge against gold? No, no, oh, it's, it's a hedge no. against inflation. Yeah, yeah. okay, great, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, get, I kind of get that, yeah. Like land is a hedge, you know, land, well-located land, houses are like a good hedge against inflation. It's something, an asset whose value will keep going up even as like inflation is going up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it preserves the, the purchasing power. So. It wouldn't be wise to hold, you know, all of your savings just as, you know, Federal Reserve notes, because they will erode in value, and you'll end up, you know, you'll end up like Germany. Well, you'll Sorry? end up like Germany when you in the thirties. Well, yeah, that means that's hyperinflation. That was, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, there's plenty of examples of fiat money that you know aren't hyperinflation. Well, that's what I mean. So that when somebody is thinking that the US dollar is not variable, it is in a way, right? It's purchasing power is yeah, variable. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah. you know, when the thing is, it, it's, it's always going to be worth its face value. That's what it means to be riskless. Right, exactly. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, other questions? Yeah, uh, Robin here. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty much as confused as I was when I started. I think I missed the detail about the the birth um, of the Bitcoin. That you say there's a certain total amount, and who's in charge of that, and how how does that have legitimacy? I'm sorry, I'm in such a basic. Uh, Oh, that's okay. Lack I mean, that's, of understanding all this. That's where anybody starts. Um, it's built into the code, which is you know open and open source for anyone to see. But it's built into the code that only 21 million bitcoins will be minted by the software program, essentially through the blockchain. Why? Because that's how the the um, value is. That's how the inventor set it up. And there's, you know, the inventor could have been one person or many people. People don't know. Satoshi right? Nakamoto is, you know, a pseudonym. It's a not a not thought to be a real person named Satoshi Nakamoto, and and nobody knows exactly who or what group of people that might have been. Might have been one person or many. It could have been many. There was a whole cypherpunk um, group that. Uh, that was involved in punk group? And it was like a it, rock band. You no, know, they just call them cypherpunks because they're, you know, into uh, punk cryptography yeah. and um, coding and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I I really recommend that what Bitcoin did podcast because uh, it has a whole beginner series 
where people can learn about Bitcoin. This guy, um, Andreas Antonopoulos, is one of the best people to explain it, unlike me. Um, well, but you're it, the best but, we have. But it was, <laughs> you know, sorry. It was, and I'd be, you know, happy if people are interested to form a group where we can all kind of learn more together. I would love to do that. And, and I, I, that's the other thing I want to say is that I very much encourage people to, you know, take anything I say critically and go look into it yourself. Um, but yeah, it's, it's built in and nobody's in charge. That's actually the best thing. How is do that you there's know? nobody in How charge you know? that can take it down and shut it down. Robin, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead. How do, you, okay. how do you know that no one's in charge? Because that's by design as well. So the, the Bitcoin blockchain exists on, um, you know, nodes, mining nodes that are distributed across the world. Well, no longer in China. <laughs> but China uh, made Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin illegal because, of course, they're trying to put in their own. They are starting their own, you know, one. Uh, yeah. What does, what does mining mean? Mining. Mining is the process by which new Bitcoins come into circulation, by which they're minted. So the remember I said that what the blockchain is, is it's a ledger. And it's a ledger of every transaction that has ever occurred with Bitcoin since the beginning of Bitcoin. And transactions are added to the blockchain in blocks and blocks are added every 10 minutes. And all of this is part of the program. And what a, a miner does is uh, it is using computer um, power, computer programming power essentially to solve a puzzle. And all of the miners, all of the computers, the nodes are competing um, to solve this puzzle. And the one that solves the puzzle and adds, then they are the one that add the next block to the blockchain and they are rewarded with a certain number of Bitcoin. And when you know Bitcoin started, it was a very large number that the miners were rewarded with. And as time goes on, um, remember I mentioned the halving? Well, the rewards become less and less, but the value of those rewards are more. Mm -hmm. And so it attracts, you know, more people into mining. So it can't be shut down because the ledger, the blockchain ledger is stored on thousands of computers across the world. You literally have to shut down every single one of those computers to extinguish Would you? the blockchain. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, if, if something happened and we no longer had any electricity worldwide, we got bigger problems, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the reason that, um, that, might happen, that mining, you know, was happening in China was because they have a surplus of hydroelectric power. And of course, Bitcoin miners, it, you know, this gets into the whole electricity thing. They're looking for the cheapest electricity they can get. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking for places where there's excess power being produced that, you know, ele excess electricity, but that would normally just be wasted. Mm -hmm. But they can buy it then at a very cheap price. And that's the way that you know, you can keep the um, cost of the mining operation down. So it was outlawed in China? Yeah. Why? Because they have their own central digital currency that they're introducing. And I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think they didn't they want, want to their, They okay. want to be, have the control through their central digital currency. Okay, that's important what you said, yeah. central. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. Bitcoin is decentralized. That's why I also not only was Bitcoin the first, so that really makes it different from other cryptocurrencies. But um, the other leading cryptocurrency you'll hear about is Ethereum. And Ethereum is, without getting too technical, it's a different system. Mm -hmm. So that whole mining and being to, able to solve a puzzle, they call that proof of work. So, so you got to work? Well, that, yeah. solving that puzzle was essentially how, um, you know, you're validating the transactions that you're adding to the blockchain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Ethereum is called proof of stake. So it's a different method that I guess without getting too technical, which I don't even know that I have it all down yet. But the point is, is that, that the proof of stake it can be controlled by a group of, you know, stakers, validators that get together and decide they want it to, 
you know, they want to manipulate the system. And uh, frankly, I mean, it's, you know, I, I think part of the problem with capitalism is that it is so interfered with and, you know, co controlled in many ways by Big the central bank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Monica, central I noticed banks, that you're yeah. here. Do you have some questions? No, but I was just wondering, I was thinking about what Jane said that, so even if you kind of thought of it as an investment, it's still a safer one because you're getting out of the U.S. currency, right? Like as opposed to investing in a U.S. corporation that's affected by the U.S. dollar and the U.S. market. Yeah. So I took a portion of my 401k or 403b or whatever it was, my retirement, and I rolled it over into a traditional IRA. And then I'm you know, I'm just going to pay the taxes because then I further rolled it over into a Roth IRA. I'm paying the taxes now. And then I bought Bitcoin with it. So now that, the whole that Bitcoin, as it grows in value, you know, will not be taxed, will grow tax free. Right. How okay. can that go tax free? Because you put it, you pay the tax on the money before you put it in. It's how Roth IRAs are set up. Jane, help me if you know. <laughs> That's how they're set up. <laughs> so. And there are, you know, now crypto IRAs where you can buy Bitcoin or any other ones. I mean, has George Soros bought a lot of Bitcoins? I don't know. Don't know. Why do you think so? Uh, <laughs> because uh, he, um, I, I, he's a manipulator of currency. Uh, that's how he got wealthy, as I understand mm -hmm. it, back mm -hmm. in the day of. Uh, manipulating currencies in different countries or different corporations until they fell on their face. And so I'm just wondering whether 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 someone like him would be would be involved with it or not. Who knows? Um, are there other questions? Because I want to ask Amy no. also about the long-term consequences of Bitcoin. Why? Okay, so let me explain how I got interested in Bitcoin. One of my favorite journalists is Glenn Greenwald, who is a journalist from Brazil, a very, uh, and he's also a lawyer and a constitutional scholar. And he is uh, really a, a critic, I guess, or an, an, an analysis, an analyst of US militarism and US abroad. He did an interview with a man who was a proponent of Bitcoin. And that man, he interviewed him. I don't know if Glenn Greenwald is a believer or not, but he interviewed a man who clearly was. And that man said that if, if Bitcoin became really uh, usable and used widely, it would really be a threat to the hegemony of the American dollar and therefore could actually put a curb on militarism abroad. And this guy had, this guy was really interesting from that respect that if American dollar had a serious competitor, perhaps it would mean a different world um, and maybe even a more peaceful one. But I wanted to ask, at least ask Amy to comment on that, that Bitcoin could have serious social, political and economic consequences, right? Yes. And anyway, so if anybody else has other questions, though. Well, I have, I have a question, two. though. What? Oh, cool. I know that. I know. I'm just going to ask Amy to explain that first. And then if anybody like Barry has criticisms of, of that, that would be fine. But and I, I have a question, too, after. Okay. And you have a question also, Monica? Okay. Yeah. So, Amy. So, I think the biggest, um, one of the biggest things about that point is that Bitcoin takes out the middleman. There's no need for a trusted third party such as a bank. Such as a bank, okay. Yeah, I mean, you have to, I think, know what you're doing because, you know, um, you, can't, you can't go to the bank and say, oh, I messed up that transaction. Can I get that back? So you really got to, you know, be able to, you know, have a, a grip on the, the tech and how to send and receive Bitcoin and how to exchange it, but it's not that difficult. Um, but there's no, it's a trustless system peer to peer. And that is, it's peer to peer, that example I said, you know, of 
sending money to a mom in El Salvador, mm -hmm. you know, and that's really what is allowing a, a large portion of, you know, the world's unbanked population. Okay, that's what to be stop. What's have. an unbanked population? An unbanked population is a population that, um, I mean, we in America, I think 30% of our population is unbanked, meaning they don't qualify for a checking versus savings account. Mm -hmm. They can't get one at a financial institution. Um, and, you know, obviously there's and other countries where they cards. don't even have, you know, stable mm -hmm. currencies or the currencies are highly, um, like in Cuba, they're very much manipulated and the government takes advantage of, of the, the currency. Well, well it's, it's, you know, we'll come, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they, this new current, I, I brought a couple of these articles by Alex Gladstein. This one's That's called, a guy. Yeah. Inside. Yeah. He, He's written about eight articles that are on the Bitcoin magazine um, dot com. This one's called Inside Cuba's Bitcoin Revolution. And the, the other one's called Check Your Financial Privilege. And they, you know, give some really good examples. Um, I think that people who don't have access to currencies like see almost immediate value in Bitcoin mm -hmm. and what it can do in terms of you know, avoiding being, U.S. dollar, <laughs> being a store of value and being able to, the, to have purchasing power. I mean, in Cuba, they are, people are using Bitcoin to purchase things. Really? Yes. And a lot of countries, you know, outside the United States. Um, as long as they have time. a smartphone. <laughs> right. You do need a smartphone and, and be able to have, you know, download a wallet. Okay. Let yeah. me ask you one more question, particularly regarding Cuba. Of course, Cuba also has, has, is, suffers from the sanctions of the United States in the first place. And the United States has, uh, has a blockade of Cuba and uh, an embargo against Cuba. Cuba cannot, for instance, get credit, um, cannot use banks very well right. in the international market. So this is interesting to me beyond the remittances question, right? in a way. Because this article talks about how um, this uh, MLC currency from you know, the Cuban government, that the only way to officially top up your MLC account is with foreign hard currency, they can't which get makes anything. it really hard, right? right, right. So how you do you get, get foreign it. hard currency? In you Cuba, know, you, you may pay someone in Miami that knows someone in Panama that can, you know, bring you a duffel bag of cash to Havana, right? I, mean, I know about very, that. It's very yeah. difficult. Yeah. So Bitcoin solves that because it allows, um, it allows, you know, access to other currencies without having to go through banks and or sidestepping the, the government. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, okay. So anyway, Barry, you had a question. Okay, the first, yeah. The first question I have is these thousands of computers around the world that are keeping the ledger, uh, who, who's paying for that? Who pays for the ledgers? Well, the miners pay fees for the electricity that it costs to do that. Okay, so the mining is not just solving a puzzle, it's also maintaining the ledger? Uh, yeah, I mean, yes. Okay, and the second it's a, it's is- The bigger issue is the CPU is required to solve the puzzle. All right, the, the second question is, um, all it would take, okay, if, if, it, if Bitcoin, threatens the United States' ability to collect taxes, um, destroy privacy, and uh, promote warfare around the world, don't you think they're going to, do you think they're going to take that, the United States government is going to take that sitting down? Or will they do something like take over the internet within the United States to destroy it? Already, all, I mean, all it would take, all it would take is uh, a verifiable threat from the United States government to start a panic, right? I mean, I don't know. I'm just know. asking. Sorry, it's already that has already happened numbers of times. You've already like, you know, freaked right. out. By um, it. However, there was the interesting interview by Glenn Greenwald, which I found the title even rather interesting. Was why Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton both oppose Bitcoin, because it does seem in some way that the United States government and the United States elites 
want to prevent people from using Bitcoin. And that's what I'm saying. And somehow it's a threat to the powers that be. And that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm not certain I understand it totally, but that was my question. But anyway, Monica had a question also, right? Yeah, my Monica. question, yeah. So you're saying there's a set amount of Bitcoin. Does that mean only a set amount of people can use it? Or like, what if all, all you know, all of a sudden all the Americans, we all went, hey, wait a minute and tried to do it, could we? Or is or can only a set amount of people get in on it, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't think it's limited at this time. No, I mean, anybody could can purchase at this point. Okay. Um, there hasn't been you know, liquidity issues that I know of. Um, but I, I mean, it, it could be in the future, I don't know. Uh, the scarcity piece of it is is to create value. Right, right. just like USD. Yeah. It's like US dollars. It's up to the Federal Reserve to decide, I guess, how many dollars to print, which right now seems unlimited. And because it is limited, it makes it right. like essentially inflation proof. Right. Because Eric. Yeah, I don't know if you, you guys can hear me, but me when I look at bitcoins, I think about the tulips in Poland. Like, uh, Why? Like right. there's some kind of uh, speculation because the scarcity also is something that maybe was done on purpose, so that you know, uh, you know, at some point it becomes rare and people rush again. There's no actual uh, production of, you know, for example, if other currency, normal currency, hard currencies are part. Uh, By nothing. You know, at least with, uh, with some production, if your country yeah. sells enough uh, t-shirts or whatever, you know, there's something tangible. But in this case, there's nothing tangible. And uh, like a bunch of computer or peer-to-peer, -peer, I mean, it's, Will it be a Ponzi scam or how can we make sure that it's not a Ponzi scam? Oh, and by the way, there are a lot of uh, multi-tier marketing Ponzi scheme things out there. So like, beware, <laughs> don't go near those. Um, if anybody's trying to sell you on that sort of thing, that's probably not a legit um, way to buy Bitcoin. I think Eric's question though is, is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme? So no, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think so, but do your own research. I, I mean, I, I guess I've been studying it and, and listening to people and reading articles and, you know, reading books. I mean, I brought like Bitcoin mm. magazine. Um, this book that I have is a really good one called The Bullish Case for Bitcoin by BJ. Um, Boyapati, it's not, it started out as a long form article and then he's made it into a book and it's a really good explanation. Um, another like classic is the book of Satoshi, which has all of the writings from Satoshi Nakamoto, who by the way is no longer around and has, you know, millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin in his wallet that is no longer accessible by anybody. So there's actually less than 19 million in circulation right now because people have lost the keys. You know, they bought Bitcoin back when it was, you know, a $5 thing to buy a Bitcoin. And then, you know, a few years later, it's worth a thousand bucks for a Bitcoin. And they're like, where's that hard drive? You know, where's that old computer? Um, so, you know, I would say it's not a Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it is. I don't know even what you mean by that, Eric, but maybe it's too late in the evening to... Yeah. to discuss that well where, you, where there's nothing the there's feeling nothing. that you're putting fiat currency into it which is this tangible thing and then it's this abstract digital currency right so it feels like what are you getting for it but what you're getting is, is, purchasing power. is a bitcoin yeah. that you can own yeah. sovereignly is that you know if you bought it the right way the government doesn't know can't take it away if you want to cross a border, you memorize 12 words and, you know, set up your phone on the other end. They, they can't confiscate it. From you. So I think it has a lot of value. I, I mean, think, I think so it's my, interesting. My portfolio is spread out. It's not all in Bitcoin. You know, I think it's good to have a diverse, you know, portfolio of, of your assets. 
as much as possible. Yeah, when it comes to puns and skin, the, the first ones are the ones who cash you know, most of it, and then boom, the, the last ones when it well, crashes. So, that's a yeah, when it crashes, to whom you go to ask for your money? In, in the case of Mador, you, we, you go to Mador for, you know, the, the US government at least can pinpoint the source of your, 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 your thing. But in the case of the bitcoins, to whom you go if by any chance bitcoins, you know, fall? I mean, but isn't it like any other investment? It just rises and falls, isn't it? I mean, no, I mean yeah, but what? speculation because, like, yeah. for example, the tulips in uh, in uh, in the bulbs in uh, in Poland, middle middle age, I think, it was just tulips. People gave like a like a high value to a, a simple tulip. It seems as good mm -hmm. as gold. And then, and then one day, you know, boom. I mean, so. Well, I mean, to your point, you know, I'm convinced Bitcoin will continue to rise in value and will, you know, remain as robust as it has been. But in 2017, you know, there was a whole lot of, you know, what they call forks in, forks. you know, forks in the coding where people would, Take a fork off of the blockchain and create and with the ethereum based ones ethereum uh, i don't even know all the technical stuff but the point is is that people created all sorts of cryptocurrency all sorts of coins and they would do these initial coin offerings and it's exactly what you say where you know the the, the people would sell the coins and they wouldn't always be sincere about what the coin was for, or what it was going to do, and it would be like a Ponzi. So I think that that can be a reality with cryptocurrencies, and you you want to be really, you know, that's why I feel Bitcoin is different than other cryptocurrencies. Yeah, because people get there with the uh, you know the hope to get like a lot of money. So, uh, yeah, well, that's what they do with like, any investment. Can the whole world get a lot of money? I mean, can like be like in economics? I think like it's. Fear, you know, one side gets money, the other one loses, and then it's balanced. Well, that's yeah. called capitalism. Can the whole world right. make money? Yeah, it's called capitalism. That's even right. Even so, <laughs> that's right. capitalism, you know, the I mean, the, the use of uh, cheap labor and enslavement, you know, yeah. rises a bit of profit, but organically, can you make like uh, exponential profit? I don't know. I don't, I have no idea because I've never done it, frankly. But I'd say capitalism is pretty crippled by the involvement of, you know, a lot of power being centralized in a small portion of the, you know, the people on this planet ruling class. The ruling class and central banks. And, you know, so if Bitcoin can provide value and access and, you know, control to those folks that haven't had access to it, then I say, you know, more power to it. I think that might be, you know, and there's also other things that the blockchain technology can really help make very transparent, like governance and voting. Um, you know, there's also uh, social media platforms being built on um, the Bitcoin network on blockchain, this uh, social media app called Zion. And, you know, it will be de decentralized so that, you know, if you say something that oh, yeah. the head of Twitter doesn't like, they can't just shut your account right. down or lock you out. Um, you know, and I think the more we can have systems where the power is decentralized and, you know, among the people rather than just a few, I mean, it's, I think it's time for that. No kidding. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Well, we wouldn't use that word in polite. Company, no, but more. But more. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think what. Yes. Less government. Less, less central government. Less. Put it this way. Less centralized banks. Less centralized government is probably not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Robin, Any questions, question. Robin? Last. Yeah. Question. What is uh, two things? Could you say again the most basic uh, website or something to read about to try to understand that yeah and second wait and my second point is i have to leave because there's a uh zoom conversation about airport ex expansion here in burlington yeah uh, yeah yeah at seven o'clock so i will have to jump off but 
What is okay. the best? Uh, so the website, one of the websites I would go to is what Bitcoin did, like one phrase, dot com. And the other one is Bitcoin magazine, one phrase, dot com. Okay. okay. Yeah. And also, I mean, even though Coinbase isn't my favorite exchange, they have, and I assume that's coinbase.com, uh, they have a lot of very short articles that explain complex topics in really um, easy to digest ways. So I, I would recommend them too. I just wouldn't recommend buying my Bitcoin. So. Thank you. Well, okay, bye Robin, because I would like to zoom into that one too, the airport thing, by the way. But, but before we end, I might uh, thank you all for coming. And I especially want to mention for Jane Nodell, thank her for her economic expertise. Jane is a professor of economics at UVM, and she's agreed to do a session with us in March on whatever she wants to, but I've asked her to talk a little bit about inflation um, and what is inflation and what is going on with our present economy, which doesn't seem to be in such hot shape. Anyway, thanks, Jane. Thanks, Monica, and thank you all also for being here. Next week, we are going to do a report from a colleague of ours, a report from another American Republic from Costa Rica during this time of a pandemic, just to see another view on what's happening in other countries about the current status of the virus and the pandemic. So, but anyway, thank you all. And we'll see you next week and in March when Jane will be back with us. Thank you all. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.